Good morning, willing workers. Welcome to our lesson for Sunday, April 10th, 2022. Our lesson today is a much anticipated lesson by many people that uh, uh, expect the Lord's return and the matter of how that occurs. So we're going to be looking in 1 Thessalonians today, uh, chapter 4, and the last part of that chapter, verses 13 to 18, is what uh, covers uh, the promised return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. title of our lesson today is Promised, and the theme of our lesson today is the promised return of Christ gives all believers hope, especially when they are grieving. We've had a lot of people in the last couple of years in our own class that have gone to be with the Lord, leaving loved ones behind to grieve their loss. The Thessalonians were also uh, experiencing the loss of their fellow Christians, and they were grieving their loss. Unfortunately, a heresy had uh, come into that church regarding the dead and the second return of Christ. And so Paul is uh, dealing with that specific question here. Paul does not go into a lot of detail in our lesson today about Christ's return because he's dealing specifically with what happens when Christ returns with the people who have already died. So with that being said, let's uh, listen to Paul's words in this letter inspired by the Holy Spirit as he writes to the Thessalonians. But... We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That's a metaphor for dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, that is, have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up that word caught up in the Greek is harpazio, harpazio, harpazo, sorry. <clears throat> it means raptured, uh, caught up together with them, that is those who have already died, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. <laughs> there is a significant difference in our language and in our grammar between a period and a comma. I think we all know that. A period brings a subject matter to a close or to an end. A comma is just a pause, a short pause, and then a continuation of the same subject matter. Paul here in this letter was concerned about how the Thessalonians 
uh, understood the death of their loved ones. Now, in our case today too, just as back then in Paul's uh, case with the Thessalonians, we need to see the passing of our Christian brothers and sisters, that includes our family, our spouses, uh, all the ones who are in Christ, their passing needs to be seen as a comma, so to speak. It's a pause uh, and not the very end. People who have not Christ in their life, for them it is the end. It doesn't mean that they are forever gone and are no longer alive. It just means that they have been consigned to hell and their eternal destiny is torment for eternity. And uh, Christians do not have that to look to. We have hope. And that hope is in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Paul's heart was filled with hope every time he thought about the Thessalonians because they had been such a good young congregation growing in the Lord and spreading the gospel throughout Macedonia and Achaia, neighboring territory. Uh, <clears throat> Paul understood, though, that Satan and his demons were very powerful, powerful uh, beings and that they can go inside of a congregation. He had already experienced that in some other churches. <clears throat> and uh, if these congregations aren't thoroughly grounded in their faith, they can wreak havoc. And in the case of Thessalonians here, uh, a heresy had come in regarding those who had died and uh, that heresy seemed to be that uh, people who had died would not uh, be resurrected. And that could not be further from the truth. And this is why uh, Paul is addressing uh, this issue with the church there at Thessalonica. Now, Paul had settled questions about their faith already in the letter. And so he comes now to this uh, uh, return of Christ in these verses here. And without this particular truth, Christians do not have a hope beyond this world. So we need to understand that. The hope of Christ's return is based upon Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. The Thessalonians and us today can take comfort in knowing that Jesus is coming back because he said so. And one day we will meet Jesus in the air. For now, though, our daily lives needed to reflect what confidence we have in the return of our Lord and Savior. So all of that being said, let's let's dig into the verses just a little bit here through our lesson. Verse 13, Paul, of course, knew Jesus would return. Here he challenged others to adopt his mindset. In other words, he had a hope and it wasn't wishful thinking. That hope was not wishful thinking. It was a hope in the return of the Lord and what happens to Christians when they die in the Lord, in the faith, uh, before his return. Christians should persevere in this life because we do have a reason to hope for something greater in the next life. And that could not be further, you know, further. Uh, that's uh, the gospel truth, if you will. <laughs> Paul wrote here about uh, Jesus' second coming. A Greek word that means that is parousia, parousia. And uh, <clears throat> his second coming 
and the bodily resurrection of believers by saying that he did not want the Thessalonians to be uninformed about their future. <clears throat> Uh, Paul was answering a question here that they had raised. And that question I've already alluded to. And that question was, uh, our Christian brothers and sisters have died. Uh, they're going to miss the resurrection. And that was not true. And Paul was writing to reassure them of those. Those who lived uh, to see the return of Jesus do not have an advantage over those who have died and uh, their spirits have gone to be with the Lord. This Greek word <clears throat> that means asleep uh, is uh, a metaphor, if you will, for death. Jesus used that same metaphor of being asleep when he described Lazarus and his death in John chapter 11. So Paul was referring to those who had gone asleep in the Lord to those who had died. Sometimes we see or may use that today. I think we use that fully knowing death and for some reason, uh, someone, some human having died is a topic that we would rather describe in terms other than the word death or died. <clears throat> False teaching about uh, these Thessalonians' loved ones uh, certainly would have shaken the confidence of these uh believers who were still alive there. So somebody had been in there and said, uh, those people that have already died, they're going to miss out on the resurrection. And so these people had uh, begin, begun to think they had no hope if they died before Christ came. And so they were wanting his return right away <laughs> so uh, that uh, they would not die without Christ. Uh, God created people. Uh, and in creating them, he gave us a whole bunch of emotions. And uh, uh, some of those emotions include pain as well as sadness. And when we lose a loved one, we experience both of those emotionally, a painful uh, experience, a very... Uh, a sad time for us to grieve the loss in this life of a loved one. Uh, but Paul, and Paul wrote of the terrible sorrow that he would have felt if his friend Epaphroditus, who came to visit him from Philippi, but he came and he got very sick while visiting with Paul. Paul was afraid he might die and the sadness and sorrow that he would have at that death uh, and uh, thinking somehow he might have been responsible for Epaphroditus becoming ill on this journey from Philippi to Rome. So uh, <clears throat> grief itself is a natural human response to the death of, of anybody, uh, but especially in the case of our loved ones, our spouse, our children, uh, siblings, uh, other family members that we were close to as we were growing up. Uh, I had the last living aunt on both sides uh, of my mother and my father died in February of 2021 and she was in her mid 90s but now there there are no aunts and uncles uh, left for me to have some connection with my family and the same is true for Kathleen and her family we now are the heads if you will of our families now, in verse 14, 
Paul continues, our confidence in Christ's return and our bodily resurrection rests on the foundation <clears throat> of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Christ is the rock that believers can trust when stepping into the unknown of eternity. I don't know about you, but death can be a scary time uh, for most people. People who are without God really have no hope <clears throat> of an eternity that they are going to uh, enjoy because they're not. Scripture tells us that. On the other hand, the Christian should, in a sense, look forward to death because it means a better life, a better place for us. But because it's an unknown, uh, most people have a fear of dying. In my own personal case, I've come close to that uh, with my bouts with cancer. I have uh, known what it's like to be close to death. Uh, as a Christian, I know that my so is destined for an eternity in the presence of the Lord. This body is not going to make it into that eternity. So I have to depart this earthly body and it will have to decay back into the dust that it came from. Uh, but the pain of going through uh, a death, whatever that cause of death is, is probably the thing that, that people fear the most. Will I hurt? Will I uh, not be able to do anything about my pain? And uh, others uh, are concerned, of course, with their eternal destiny. But as Christians, we can be assured, number one, that to be absent from this body, we will be present with the Lord. And in the Lord's presence, there is no more pain, no more grief, no more sorrow, no more tears. Only eternal bliss in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to understand that Christians who died before the return of Christ uh, are not at a disadvantage. In other words, this heresy they, they were asking about was just that. It was a lie of the devil. And God, <clears throat> God is going to raise those who have died in Jesus and their hope was just that. It was a hope and a comfort that Paul was offering to them. Now, this is an important doctrine for us to understand and to embrace. The resurrection of Jesus <clears throat> is proof of our own resurrection one day. Now, Paul writes further about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> if Christ's resurrection was a fraud, our faith would be empty and we would be left with no hope of anything to cling to. <clears throat> we would, of all people, be most pitied. Paul writes about that, <laughs> that uses those words in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 verse 19. But Christ's resurrection is real. And we don't grieve our loved one's losses in this life without the hope that as Christians we have. That is the sure confidence of what the Lord has told us.
Verse 15, Paul emphasized throughout his letters that his words are teachings from the Lord and not his own. Uh, it's very similar to what Ezekiel was saying in his uh, book when he would say, thus says the Lord. In other words, this is not Ezekiel's words you're hearing. These are words the Lord has given me to say to you. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. Paul had spoken these words in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he always did when, when he wrote, when he talked. <clears throat> and that the message that he was giving had been approved by God. The Thessalonians knew their faith. And he, they knew it was rooted in something deeper than Paul's talent for persuasion. I'm not so sure how persuasive Paul was as a person, uh, but uh, uh, certainly his words from the Lord were quite uh, persuasive. The Thessalonians knew what Paul meant when he said that his teachings about Christ's second coming were a word from the Lord. Uh, his return carried the same authority as the Messiah. In other words, if Jesus had been present there in front of the Thessalonians and telling them this, that's exactly the same thing as Paul being present. Christ had given him those words. Paul outlined a sequence of events in Christ's second return. The first thing that he addressed was the destiny of all who are alive when Christ comes back. They will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, the dead will be called from the grave first. Immediately after that, the ones who are alive in Christ will also be called. The Thessalonians could know without a doubt that the dead will participate in the second coming of Christ and the living would have no advantage over the dead. It is also worth noting here that Paul used the first person to describe the living here. Paul is my belief in reading his letters uh, with the exception of 2 Timothy uh, that Paul expected to be alive when Christ returned. And 2 Timothy, of course, was Paul's swan song uh, to uh, pass on to Timothy the baton that Paul had carried up to that point. Uh, shortly after writing that letter, Paul was martyred uh, by having his head separated from his body there in Rome. But as long as Paul was alive, he would assume Jesus' return was imminent. This is a teaching that uh, continues today. Unfortunately, a lot of people have uh, gone off into heretical territory to try to teach their own thinking about this. But we certainly need to know that Christ could return at any moment. Uh, there's not really a prophecy left to be fulfilled that uh, uh, must be fulfilled before Christ can return. <clears throat> so uh, Paul was content with the idea that, G that he himself might die before Jesus came back. And Paul was very open about that that situation as he talked about death itself and uh, and and we we can read in his letters where he was torn between a desire to be in heaven right then or the command to remain and preach the gospel and he said to be away from the body would be bliss. To be here would be Christ. <clears throat>
So uh, he also told us in his letters that to be absent from the body, that is this earthly body, is to be present with the Lord. That does away with any, any heretical talk about some time uh, between death and life in heaven. Uh, there is no purgatory, as some teach. There is no psychopanikia. That's a big term that means you are asleep somehow until Christ return and then you suddenly wake up and you're there in heaven. There is none of that uh, that goes on. We are either alive in this body, in this world, or if this body dies, we are present immediately with the Lord. And we need to understand that as Christians today. Let's move on to verse 16. I want you to notice particularly that there are no dates there are no time frames given in any of scripture regarding the return of Jesus. Jesus himself told the disciples that even he in his earthly uh, body did not know when he was going to return. And the disciples kept asking about that. And the only thing that Jesus could say is that you will understand the signs of the times. Well, the signs of the times point toward Jesus' return since the day he rose from the grave. And for 2,000 years now, we have anticipated Christ's return. Uh, but Dear Christian, we need to we need to understand and bow the knee to our Lord and Savior and to God the Father that his timing is perfect. We're just we're just uh, not wanting to wait. Uh, but we have to understand that God is the one who has the plan for this uh, creation. And it is he who will determine the return of our Lord and Savior. Now, in this particular section, uh, Paul explained that Jesus himself will descend from heaven. At, now, if you think about this, Jesus came down in his first uh, coming, the uh, first advent, if you will, but he came as a baby. He was relatively unknown, relatively uncelebrated. Yeah, we had a few shepherds from around the hills of Bethlehem to come. Uh, a few months to up to a couple of years later, we had some wise men that came from the east who brought gifts and worshiped. Uh, but other than that, uh, that's all of the pumped and circumstance, if you will, besides what we read about heaven did with his first coming. So Jesus came humble uh, through ordinary means, human, human means, and uh, his birth was nearly unnoticed. Now, of course, he became quite noticed when he began his ministry <clears throat> and his ministry and the way he taught uh, resulted in <clears throat> his uh, being put to death. And uh, it was not just a, a one-time event. These uh, uh, elders and leaders, religious leaders of the Jews, they began plotting his demise almost from the outset of his ministry. Uh so Jesus came the first time, but Paul uh, notes here in this letter that there will be three loud sounds uh, at the return of Christ. The first is a cry of command. 
The Greek word here that Paul uses is a military term relating to a loud shout to the army that is spread over a battlefield to uh, go into battle or to uh, cease from battle. <clears throat> Christ came to earth humbly in Bethlehem the first time. When he returns, he returns as the conquering king, having defeated death and hell and having uh, brought his own into himself. While the command itself is not given here, it could be an announcement of his return along with an order to the dead and to the living to rise. <clears throat> and understand this, that command is the command that calls us to meet him in the air. And as we rise, we will be given our glorified bodies that we will inhabit for eternity. Wonderful, wonderful thinking here. Okay, uh, Jesus' uh, command here would be similar to what uh, Jesus said when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, I've often heard people say that had Jesus not called Lazarus by name, that all the dead in Christ at that point would have been risen from the grave. Now, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, these two things are closely associated with shouting. Uh, think back about John when he heard uh, while in worshiping in the spirit in heaven uh, the presence of a voice of many waters. Uh, John heard the voice of Christ talking to him and the sound of it was the roar of many waters such as the falls of Niagara. If you've ever been there, I have not. I've heard of it before and I've heard it on TV and that sort of thing. Now, there are two archangels that are identified in Scripture. Uh, we have the name Gabriel and we have the name Michael. Now, these uh, angels are identified not only in the New Testament, but also back in the book of Daniel. Uh, we get their names. And the presence of archangels here at Christ's uh, second return implies that there are heavenly hosts who are involved in Christ's second return. Now, let me move on to the trumpets. In Paul's day, and probably a millennia before that, uh, we know that David in his kingdom used trumpets. We know that Joshua also used trumpets in his time. Uh, but trumpets were not musical instruments as we think of them today. Uh, they were used to announce some kind of news, good or bad. Uh, it could be the arrival of dignitaries, the start of some religious festivals as we read in the Old Testament. That also the trumpet was also used to announce the return of an army that had been triumphant in their conquest. Now, I think we need to understand uh, a bit about history in order to get a, a better understanding of this uh, second coming of Christ here and being meeting in the air. Uh, so, Father, uh, so God has uh, got us uh, coming up to meet him in the air. Back in the ancient world, when the army was, uh, was uh, triumphant in battle and they returned to uh, home or the, the, the city, like in this case, Rome, uh, 
instead of just marching right into the city, these these armies had all kinds of bounty, booty, if you will, uh, that they had confiscated from the ones they had defeated. They had people that they had brought back who would become slaves. Uh, and uh, so the army typically would camp somewhere nearby the city and uh, the army commanders would go into the city, into Rome in this case. They would meet with the uh, emperor, uh, the Caesar, if you will. They would meet with the uh, other government dignitaries uh, and uh, they would plan a triumphal uh, entry from their camp into the city. And this would be a time when all the people of the city could come out and welcome back those who had gone off to battle. And they would also uh, see the bounty that was being brought back, that they had conquered and taken. They could also jeer and uh, mock the captives who were being brought into the city and would be put on the auction block to be sold as slaves. But the important point here is that before any of this happened, the soldiers would camp outside the city of Rome in this case. Now, the way Paul has described Jesus' return here, we have similar uh, description. Christ will descend, but it doesn't say he descends all the way to earth. It says he will descend and call his people out of the grave, out of their earthly bodies. And as they uh, go into the air to meet him on the clouds of glory, these people, their spirits, will have a new body that they will inhabit. That is when our glorification occurs. Our sanctification has ended. Our glorification has begun and it lasts for eternity. Now, <clears throat> Paul dug a little deeper into <clears throat> resurrection in his other letters. Uh, and, and the second coming of the Lord, is, for that matter. He, he dug quite uh, a bit deeper. So uh, we don't get all of the detail here, but this detail that he does give us is something we need to understand how, and how it occurs and why Paul used such a description. So Paul has dealt with the issue of those who had died in Christ, were in the grave, Paul now noted that those who are alive, they don't miss a thing immediately. And, and yeah, I don't know, nanoseconds after the dead are rising, the living are rising with them. So it's a it's a order of uh, the command. It's not it's not that we lose anything or that we have to wait any amount of time. It's just an order in which the command is given. The dead in Christ first, then the living in Christ. And it could all happen in just such a fast time that we don't even think about it. Uh, Paul writes that they will be caught up together with the resurrected believers uh, mentioned. And the Greek word here uh, is the Greek word that means to seize or to carry off. I uh, would remind you of uh, Philip in uh, Acts who had gone out into the desert and had talked with the, uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch and brought him to Christ through the gospel there at an oasis in the desert. And once that was done, he was snatched away. He was seized or caught up. Uh, that same Greek word describes that event for Philip as it does the event that Paul is talking about here. Pointed out, uh, Paul pointed out that this reunion occurs in the clouds. I've already said these clouds are the clouds of heaven. The Shekinah glory that Christ is upon when he went up 
in Acts chapter 1. He rode on those clouds. When he returns, he'll be on those same clouds. Uh, Jesus also associated his return with clouds in Mark chapter 13. And he, he ascended in a cloud, as I already mentioned. Now, this second reunion will be with Jesus himself. Uh, they will meet. We will meet the Lord in the air. <clears throat> in the first century literature that was not scripture, such wording would refer to welcoming a dignitary. A delegation would meet the official outside the town and escort him into the city. And in the same way, believers meet Jesus by going to him in the air. And uh, it represents the first ever gathering of the true church of Christ. Uh, once united with Christ, his people will never be separated from his presence. Paul emphasized that we will always be with the Lord. And this does not necessarily mean that other events won't take place between his return and the final culmination of the new heaven and the new earth. I think we know that from scripture. Uh, most of us believe that there is a thousand year reign of Christ uh, on this earth as we know it before a new heaven and a new earth is brought. So this truth would have brought comfort to the Thessalonian readers uh, that Paul has explained. While Jesus has always promised to walk with his people in this life, his return will mark a new stage of experience and the person of Christ. Praise God that we have that to look forward to. Verse 18, Paul concludes his teaching by returning to the main purpose for his writing. As noted, he was not trying to give any detailed timeline of Christ's return or even a full outline of the eschatology of Christ. Uh, or of us as Christians. He simply wanted to remind the Thessalonians that Jesus was coming back for his people, whether they were alive or dead. He wanted to offer encouragement to those who were still living and struggling uh, with questions and with their grief. Paul reminded these Thessalonians that the ministry of hope and comfort was not reserved for the apostles alone. It was not even reserved for the leaders, the Christian leaders of the individual churches. The Thessalonians had to remember that these truths uh, were truth themselves, and they were to encourage each other with the teachings that they have in those truths. Christians have a responsibility to remind one another that these words are the true key to dealing with our loss and our grief of our loved ones. Empathy has its place, but must be filtered through the gospel message. If encouragement is filtered through the gospel, it will provide comfort and hope for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Brothers and sisters, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us the Apostle Paul, especially those of us who are of Gentile heritage. And Father, I thank you that you have given him uh, wisdom to write about the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that we, every time we read about this eschatological event, that we will understand more and more about the return of your only begotten Son, that we will not fall into <clears throat> heresy by thinking uh, things that are not given to us by your word alone. So, Father, Father, 
be with us in this coming week. Make your presence felt in these words of yours that we have looked at today. Make them sink into us in a way that glorifies you and your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.